We're in Genesis chapter 17 this morning. Genesis chapter 17, verses 1 through 7. When Abram, when Abram, excuse me, was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to Abram and said to him, I am Almighty God. Walk before me and be blameless, and I will make my covenant between me and you, and will multiply you exceedingly. When Abram fell on his face, God talked with him, saying, As, as for me, behold, my covenant is with you, and you shall be a father of many nations. No longer shall your name be Abram, but your name shall be Abraham. For I have made you a father of many nations. I will make you exceedingly fruitful, and I will make nations of you, and kings shall come from you. And I will establish my covenant between me and you and your descendants after you in their generations for an everlasting covenant to be God to you and your descendants after you. God reveals himself to us and when he does, there is a response that is required. There is a response that is required of us. No less than full and complete obedience will do. We see this in the life of Abraham. We saw it a few weeks back before the anniversary celebration. And I remember the week before that, I preached a message on Genesis chapter 12, how God had called Abram to leave his family and his people and go to the land that he was going to show him. And he got halfway there. You remember? We'll look at that in just a moment. But my point is, in introducing this to you tonight, this morning, is that half obedience is not enough. God requires total and complete obedience. So let's begin. Everything in scripture, everything in the Christian life begins with a revelation of Almighty God. And that's what we have in verse 1. When Abram was 99 years old, 99 years old. Is that what it said? Yes, that's 99 years old. I'm 58 and I'm thinking, boy, Lord, my days are, and, and admittedly back in those days, men lived longer. The, the effects of the change after the flood had not completely taken effect and uh, men were living still uh, considerably longer than they do today. But Abram was 99 years old and the Lord appeared to him. God revealed himself to Abram. Once again, he had already revealed himself back in chapter 12 and now he reveals himself again. And he says, I am El Shaddai, almighty God. Walk before me and be blameless. We could spend hours just on that first verse. God reveals himself to Abram. He says, I am El Shaddai, Almighty God. Can I say this, that before we go any further and before we do anything as a church, and before we embark on any kind of a project or a mission or anything, the first thing we need to figure out and settle is who is God? He is Almighty God. He is El Shaddai. Notice the timing of this. Abram is 99 years old. And up until this point, his life had featured a whole lot of imperfections. I use that word because in the original, uh, in the King James Version, the word blameless is perfect. Walk before me and be perfect. Blameless, perfect, complete. It all means the same thing. God says, be perfect. And Abraham's life had been marked by a series of imperfections, as I mentioned a moment ago. When he was 75, 75 years old, he departed from Haran, and he received the promise of the land. Now Haran, remember, was halfway between Ur of the Chaldees and the promised land, the land of Canaan. Now, of course, we pointed out that they went up north to, to Haran and then back south because to go across the desert would have been nearly impossible. It was just uninhabitable, untravelable. It was, it's just a de desert. So you followed the, the trade routes. You followed the water. You followed the, 
the paths. And so they, they went up and, and they stopped in Haran. And it was there that Terah, Abram's father, died. Terah, we told you a couple weeks ago, means delay or stop or hinder. And when Terah was dead, at that point, God appeared to Abram and said, get out of the land, get away from your family. And Abram obeyed partially, imperfectly. They got halfway to where they were told to go. Now notice God's command in verse one. He says, walk before me and be perfect, complete. Haran means dry, desolate. There was no new word from God while he was there. There was a dead spot in his life and in his relationship with the Lord. He went on a little further to Shechem, which means strength, and then to Morah, which means instruction, and he got instruction from the Lord, and finally went to Bethel, the house of the Lord. That's where he had to go to get right. And then on later on to Hebron, which is, of course, means fellowship. Along the way, at age 86, Abram got a little impatient. He thought, I'm 86 years old. God has promised to make a nation of me and give me a child. My wife is barren and can't have babies. So how about if I go into her handmaid, her servant, Hagar, which he did. She shouldn't have done. And out of that adulterous relationship, they had the son, Ishmael. Ishmael would become the father of many nations as well. He is the father of the Arab nations, the, the other Semitic tribes other than Israel. And if you know anything about the history of the Middle East and the history of Israel, all of their enemies have come out of the, the offspring of Ishmael. Ishmaelites. And God said, I'm going to bless you. You're going to be a father of many, many nations as well. But there's always going to be turmoil. There's always going to be strife. You see, Abram, Abram cut corners. He shortcutted God's plan. And I want to tell you this morning that God does not need any help from us to accomplish his purpose. Did you hear me? God requires obedience. God blesses our obedience by allowing us to be a partaker in his work. Okay, that's the way we need to look at it. We need to look at it that God is sovereign and he is going to accomplish his purpose. He requires obedience from us and he blesses our obedience by allowing us to share in his great work, his great ministry. But make no mistake, God doesn't need any of us. He could accomplish anything he wants all by himself. He didn't need any help to speak the universe into existence. He doesn't need any help to do his work today. Whenever you hear anyone say, God needs, back up and tell them, no, God does not need anything. God, by definition, does not need anything. God does not try to do anything. God's trying to get me to listen. God's trying to show me. God's not trying to do anything. God doesn't try. God does. He is almighty God. He doesn't require any help from anyone. What kind of trouble we get into, boy, whenever we try to help God, right? We try to help God. Or we try to do it our way. We say, God, you know, I see what you're trying to do here, number one. God doesn't try. But, you know, let me, let me help this along. Let me help you out here. Huh. We do it our way. Never works, does it? Never works. So it's 13 years later now since Ishmael was born. Abram is 99 years old. Isaac has not yet been born. And God comes and reveals himself again to Abram. And he promises to establish his covenant and fulfill his promise and give him a son. Really, this is not 
it, it, it's a repetition, it's a, a, a restoration, it's a revival, if you will, of the original covenant, of the promise that he had already given, given him. There's nothing really new here, but he meets him here at Bethel, and he reveals himself to God, to, to Abram, I should say, as God Almighty, El Shaddai. I can do anything. I don't need any help from the likes of you, Abram. Boy, how much trouble and stress we could avoid if we remember that God is God and we're not. He is almighty. He can handle anything. I have to say, one of the greatest victories that I ever experienced, I didn't say I won, because I didn't. God did. One of the greatest victories I ever experienced was a few years ago when I was in the midst of a major crisis and in despair, I cried out to God and I said, Lord, you handle this. I I'm through trying to tell you how to do things. I'm not even gonna ask you to do any, I'm just gonna say, Lord, this is in your hands. It's your situation. The battle is the Lord's. I'm not gonna fight in this battle. Lord, you fix it. And God brought one of the greatest blessings of my life out of that experience in that time. How different our lives would be. And what a difference it would make in our decisions and our priorities and our obedience if we would just finally realize that God is God and he doesn't need any help from us. Oh, for a revelation of God in which he would remind us definitively that he is God. He alone is God. So what does he do? Number one, in verse one, as we say in the army, he gives Abram his orders. Here are your orders. He says, number one, walk before me. Now, what is it to walk before the Lord? What is it to walk before the Lord? Have you ever thought about that term? I think it means to walk and live as in his sight, which we do. Sometimes we don't acknowledge it, but we do. Hebrews 4.13 says, There is no creature hidden from his sight, but all things are naked and open to the eyes of him with whom we have to do. So let me ask you this. How is your hidden life, the hidden life of your soul, what does God see with his all-seeing eyes when he looks at you and me? When he looks into our heart, when he sees us when we're all alone. It's been said that character is what you are when no one else is watching. Well, that never really happens because God is always watching. But what is it that God sees when no one else sees but him? What does God see in our hearts? You know, the Bible says the heart is desperately wicked and deceitful of above all things, who can know it? But the Bible says, I am God and I search the hearts. I try the hearts. He knows what's in our heart. We don't, we can't, but he does. So how does God see us this morning? How dishonest and ridiculous it is for us to claim, Second Chronicles chapter seven and verse 14, if my people will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways. We claim to be seeking God. We're going to talk about that tonight in the message of this evening. We've been talking about the elements of that promise. Humbling ourselves and prayer and repentance and tonight seeking the face of God. What does it mean to seek the face of God? If all the while we're hiding from him like uh, Adam and Eve hid themselves from the presence of God. Jonah got in a boat to go down away from the presence of God and, and then claimed that we're seeking God. The Bible says in Hebrews 12 and 14, we're to pursue peace and holiness, holiness without which no one will see God. We want to claim we're seeking God and we have sin, hidden sin in our life and perhaps even open sin in our life. That's why repentance is an important part of revival. 
First Kings 9 and 4 says, Now if you walk before me as your father David walked, in, in integrity of heart and in uprightness, integrity of heart and uprightness, to do according to all that I have commanded you, that's obedience, if you keep my statutes and judgments, Second Chronicles 7 and 17, a couple verses later, as for you, if you walk before me as your father David walked, and do according to all that I've commanded you, and if you keep my statutes and my judgments, the same thing. It's to live in obedience. It's to live with the understanding that God is seeing every move we make and everything we do. And he knows the thoughts and intents of our heart. Walk before me. Now, I want you to see this sentence as it's structured here. He says, walk before me and be blameless. You might read that as two separate commands. Walk before me and be blameless. I see it, I think, and I'm, I believe I'm correct, as a, a, a command with a promise. Walk before me and you'll be blameless, in other words. Walk before me and be blameless. It's, it's along the line of what Jesus said. Follow me, he said, that's the command. Follow me and the promise. I will make you fishers of men. That's not another commandment. It's a promise. Follow me. Our part, follow me. God's part, I'll make you fishers of men. Abide in me, John chapter 15, and you will bear much fruit. It's not another command. The command is abide in me, and the result is we'll bear much fruit. We'll see that in the text. Look at verse 6. I will make you exceedingly fruitful. You see? So, Genesis 6 and 9, the Bible says that Noah was just and perfect, that is blameless, same word, in his generation. Deuteronomy 8, 13, you shall be perfect with the Lord thy God. Again, that word means blameless. Uh, Matthew 5 and verse 48, Jesus said, be ye perfect even as your Father which is in heaven is perfect, God sets a pretty high standard. His standard is holiness. His standard is perfection. Pursue peace with all men and holiness, without which no one will see God. That's the standard. Perfection, complete and total obedience. Not partial obedience. Now, who is it that demands it? It's God who is perfect. We well, say, well, nobody's perfect. Well, God is. He says, be perfect as I am perfect. Now, along with that, I'll remind you of Psalm 103 and verse 14, where it says, he knows our frame. He remembers that we're but dust. Isn't that comforting? But he doesn't lower the bar. I, I Boy, we could get into a long, long, long discussion. In fact, there's a long discussion that's been going on for almost 2,000 years about a prayer that St. Augustine wrote. He said, command what you will and enable us, Lord, to do what you command. So many words. And the church went berserk over that. They said, how could God command something that's impossible for us to do? Well, as I read the Bible, God does it all the time. Right here, he says, be perfect. Be blameless. How are we to do that? Only by God's aid and help. God commands us to repent and turn. You say, and, and those of us of a Reformed tradition, a Reformed uh, orientation, we believe that it's impossible for anyone to repent and come to Christ and, and, and obey because we're totally hereditarily depraved and everything about our being is contrary to God and against God. But And yet God commands all men everywhere to repent. Well, how can he command that if it's not in us to do that? Well, he does it and, and he's just to do it because he also enables us. How did God command, how did Jesus command Lazarus to come out of the tomb when he was dead? How did Jesus command the lame man to get up and walk? How did Jesus command the blind man to see? He also enabled him to see. So along with our orders, there's an obligation, an obligation. I am almighty God. I am the perfect one. You walk before me and be perfect. When God appears to us and reveals himself to us, there's an obligation simply because who he is. Again, I mentioned the military. When a general gives an order, 
You don't sit down and say, well, General, let me think about that. I'll think about it if I want to do that and get back to you. No, that's not how it works. Orders are orders. And when God gives a command, we are obligated to keep it simply, listen, simply because of who he is. He is Almighty God. We must respond. We must respond appropriately because of his nature and his character, because of who he is. Again, Matthew 5, 48. You be perfect because I'm perfect, he says. So our service and our worship and our ministry and our obedience and our sacrifices and our prayers and our offerings to him must be worthy of the Almighty God, the King of Kings. Don't give God your junk, your leftovers. God demands our very best. Why? Because he gave us his dearest and his best. We're going to talk about that in a couple of weeks. Again, the life of Abram. His obligation, then here's his oath in verse 2. He says, I will make my covenant between me and you, and I will mu multiply you exceedingly. He says, I'll make my covenant between me and you. Again, verse 4. As for me, behold, my covenant is with you, and you shall be a father of many nations. Verse 7. I will establish my covenant between me and you and your descendants. Verse 9, the Lord said to Abram, As for you, you shall keep my covenant, you and your descendants after you throughout your generations. This is the renewal, the repetition, the reminder of the covenant. We see it in verse 7, which is cited for us in uh, Galatians 3 and verse 16. And there God identifies the seed, not the seeds, New King James Version says descendants. The King James says the seed. And Paul points out very significantly that he says the seed, not the seeds, plural. There is one seed. That seed is Christ. And so if we are in Christ, we are Abraham's children, Abraham's seed. Notice it's God who makes the covenant. It's always God. It's always God. We respond. We obey. Uh, Psalm 51 and verse 12. Restore to me the joy of what? Thy salvation. It's God's salvation. It's not ours. It's God's covenant. Uh, 2 Samuel 23 and verse 5. At the end of David's life, he said, Although my house is not so with God, that is perfect and blameless just as we're commanded to be here. He says, yet he has made with me an everlasting covenant. He has made with me an everlasting covenant. It, it's God that makes the covenant. He says, ordered in all things and secure. This is all my salvation and all my desire, though it may not grow. And in verse five, he says, I will make you the father of many nations father of many nations. It's God who makes the covenant. And he makes it between himself and me, specifically. Look at verse 4. As for me, behold, my covenant is with you. You shall be the father of many nations. He's talking to Abram, obviously. Galatians 3.29, again, if we're in Christ, then we're Abraham's seed. So, we're the, the beneficiaries of that covenant. We're the heirs according to the promise. But he makes it specifically, personally, particularly. So quit worrying about anybody else. God calls us individually and specifically. He calls you by name. Remember Peter uh, at the end of the book of John where he's restored? He says, well, Lord, what about this man? And Jesus said, you never mind about him. You follow me. You follow me. What's God speaking to you about today? You. Not anybody else. What's he speaking to you about? Don't worry about anybody else. This is for you. Come to church and say, Preacher, it felt like you were talking right directly to me. Yeah, today I am. Today the Lord is. Okay, He's speaking to me too, by the way. Don't get your feelings hurt. What's God dealing with you about? And by you, I mean me. Right? 
I will make my covenant between me and you. Number two, he says, I will multiply you. Look at verse two. I will make my covenant between me and you, and I will multiply you exceedingly. Verse four, you should be the father of many nations. Verse six, I will make you exceedingly fruitful. I will make nations of you. Kings will come from you. Verse seven, I will establish my covenant between me and you and your descendants after you and their generations for an everlasting covenant to be God and you and your generate and your descendants after you. God had already told Abram, your descendants will be more than the stars of the heaven, more than the sands of the beach. You know, it's a lot of descendants. God doesn't need any shortcuts. I don't, you don't have to go find Hagar and work it out with her because you think that God can't keep his promise. God is not slack concerning his promise. 2 Peter 3 and verse 9 says, He hasn't forgotten or forsaken you. He never will. Hebrews 13, 5. Not only the promise to provide descendants, but also to bless them in verse 7. God's desire is to make us exceedingly fruitful, he says in verse 6. He desires to bless multitudes through us. Chapter 12, verses 2 and 3. I will bless them that curse you and I'll curse them that curse you. And in you all the nations of the earth shall be blessed. Can we ever know, even begin to imagine the extent of God's blessings through us? The lives that he will touch through us? The work that he will do through us? I always say you can count the seeds in an apple, but only God knows the number of apples in a seed. I ask you this today, who will be saved because of your obedience? Who will be in heaven because of your obedience? Who will be blessed because of your obedience? And then here's the other side of that. Who will miss out on the blessing? Who will be lost because of our disobedience? What blessings will be missed because of our disobedience? More on that in a moment. It's staggering to think. Um, one of my favorite movies around Christmas time is It's a Wonderful Life. You know, how many lives were touched because of one man, George Bailey, and how many blessings were missed because of the absence of one man. We could never even begin to know or comprehend. So number one, that's all part of number one, the revelation of God. Number two, let's look at the response. Three things are required. Chapter uh, 17 and verse 3. Then Abram fell on his face. A posture of complete and total surrender. Complete and total surrender. That is the only appropriate response to meeting the Lord. You don't sit and negotiate. I, I'm amused. I'm, I'm thinking of a friend of mine, a young lady who joined the army a few years back, and she went away to, to boot camp. And she was told by her drill sergeant that um, Saturday night was free time. And so that would be a good time for them to go back and clean their barracks and clean their weapons and take them apart and do all sorts of uh, Know, personal maintenance of their equipment and things like this. And she says, excuse me, drill sergeant, if it's free time, then don't we get to do what we want to do? Uh, why are you telling us what we can and can't do on our free time? And I asked her, how many push-ups did you end up doing that night on your free time? You don't negotiate with God. You fall in obedience and submission to him. Number two, Position of worship. Proskunio, the Greek word, means in the manner of a dog. In the manner of a dog. It means to be down on all fours. Prostrate before the Lord. An expression of reverence. Some have taken that word to mean to kiss the hand. As you would bow down before a prince or someone and kiss the hand. Matthew 28, 17 says that's what the disciples did. Again, it's one of those, it's not two things, it's one thing. They saw the Lord and they fell down and worshipped him. It's a natural 
reflexive response. It doesn't have to be rehearsed. It doesn't have to be uh, manufactured. They saw the Lord and they worshiped. The appropriate response, again, the appropriate response to understanding who God is, is the only way to come to him is bowing in obedience. And then, look at it, it says, Abram fell on his face and God talked with him. God talked with him. You know what that's called? That's called prayer. Now I thought prayer was when we talked to God. Really? Huh. You ever stop and listen to God? You ever pray with your Bible open and read a few verses and then talk to God about what you just read and then listen back to what he has to say and read a few more? It's called conversation. It's called communication. Dialogue. Are your prayers a monologue or a dialogue? The nature of true prayer, prayer it's, it's meeting with God, meeting him on his terms, surrendering to him, worshiping him, standing in awe of him. And the Bible says he spoke to Abram. I wonder, boy, I wonder why God doesn't ever speak to me. Why doesn't God ever speak to me? Maybe because you don't, pardon me, shut up and listen. Appropriate to let God have the first word. Listen more and talk less. So we see the revelation and the response. Let me give you the reception of the blessings. Notice verse 4. Abram receives a new purpose. He says, as for me, behold, my covenant is with you and you should be the father of many nations. You see, our purpose, God's purpose for us, I should say, God's, our ordained, God ordained purpose is to be reproducing disciples. The father of many nations. God has blessed us, chapter 12 and verse two, blessed us to be a blessing. None of us is saved to keep it to ourselves. You know, they used to say, keep the faith. No, give it away. Spread it, broadcast it. Our purpose is to be reproducing, making disciples. God's commission for us was to go into the world and make disciples, teaching them all things God has commanded us and baptizing those who believe. And he said, as we do that, lo, he said, I'll be with you always, even to the end of the age. God's purpose is for us to be disciple makers, reproducing ourselves. Will you accept your new purpose, your new orders? Along with that new purpose comes a new identity. Verse 5, no longer will your name be Abram, but it shall be Abraham. So often God gives a convert a new name. Symbolizing a new identity, the new birth, if you will. Simon, uh, Simon became Peter. Saul became Paul. Abram, which means exalted father, became Abraham, which means father of a multitude. His new purpose. He wasn't just the high exalted father. He was now the father of a multitude. He can be an exalted father of one, but God made him a father of a multitude. We've got to understand this. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians 5 and 17, if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. The old things are passed away. Behold, all things have become new. That's what we illustrate in baptism, isn't it? When someone's baptized, they're buried in the likeness of Christ's death and raised, what? To walk in newness of life. Newness of life. Have you understood and appreciated and accepted your new identity? Do you understand why we're here? What our purpose is? Number, letter, letter C, verse 6, he got a new life. He said, I'll make you exceedingly fruitful. I'll make many nations of you. Kings will come out of you. A new life. Galatians 2 and 20 says, I'm crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life that I now live in the flesh, I live it by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Jesus said in John 15 and 6, 
I, you've not chosen me. I've chosen you and ordained you that you go and bear much fruit and that your fruit should remain. And so you'll be identified as my disciples. Luke 19, 10, Jesus' priority. The Son of Man came to what? Seeking to save that which was lost. And don't worry about it. God will make us fruitful. That's his purpose. That's why he saves us. Why he ordains us to go and bear much fruit. John chapter 15 and verse 4. He said, abide in me and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine. Neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit. For without me you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he's cast out as a branch and is withered. And they gather them up and throw them into the fire and they're burned. If anyone abides in me and my words abide in you, you will ask what you desire and it will be done for you. By this, my Father is glorified that you bear much fruit and so shall you be my disciples. Again, the command is abide in me. The result is you bear much fruit. Who can know how many lives would be changed if we would obey God and abide in him? How many won't be blessed or saved if we disobey? When we receive new life from God, we're to pass it on to others. Lastly, he says, we have a new relationship. Verse 7. I'll establish my covenant between me and you and your descendants after you and their generations for an everlasting covenant to be your God and your descendants after you. We are called to live in a covenant relationship. You know what that's like? That's like marriage. It's a covenant, right? Forsaking all others, keeping only unto thee until death do us part. It's marriage, right? It's a covenant. We're in a covenant with God. And we're responsible for those who come after us in their generation. And the Bible says he will be our God. And he'll be their God. And we'll be his people and he'll dwell among us. Remember, we've been talking about that. He'll be with us as he's with them, Joshua 1 and verse 5. But we're to live in that new relationship with God. 1 Corinthians 6 verse 19 says, What? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which you have of God, and you are not your own? You are bought with a price. Therefore, glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. You've got to understand that he's our God. He's the almighty God. Almighty God, our obligation is to walk before him and be blameless. And what's the result? He says, I will bless you. I will multiply you. I will make you fruitful. When you are obedient to me, when we acknowledge him for who he is, the almighty God and our savior. Savior, let me ask you this. Who do you understand that God is this morning? Who is God? Do you understand who he is? He is the almighty God. We talked about this a week or so ago. Most people believe in a God that's just a little bit bigger than them and they call him out whenever they get in trouble and they need him. No, no, no. He is almighty God. We're called to walk before him, to live before him, to live under the all-seeing glare of his piercing eye. To be holy and blameless. Have you come and met him on his terms? Fully surrendered to him? Are you living in a real, dynamic, living relationship with him? Today, this morning, this week, what would that look like if we were? How do you know? Well, here's a test. Is he making you fruitful? Is he multiplying you? Is he reproducing you in the lives of others? This is his desire. 
We're to surrender and yield to him and come into conformity with his will and his perfect for our lives. Revisit 2 Samuel 23 and verse 5. God has made an everlasting covenant ordered in all things and secure. And this is all our salvation. That's all. It's all about what he did, not what we do. He's taken care of our salvation. That's not in question. But he says, this is all my salvation and my desire. Will he not? Will he not make it increase? Will he not make it increase? God desires to multiply us just as he promised he would do for Abraham. Father in heaven, we come to you today and acknowledge that you are God and we're not. We come today to fall before you in worship, in surrender, and to yield to you in obedience, that you might have your will and your way in our lives and do whatever you will in and through us to accomplish your purpose. We pray, Lord, you might multiply us and use us as instruments to bless many, many people and that many nations, many Gentiles, many heathen would come to you through our lives and our witness. That we might be instruments of revival, of evangelism, of instruments of sharing your gospel with the lost. We come to surrender to you today and pray that you would use us to accomplish your sovereign purpose, knowing and acknowledging that you don't need any help from us, but that it is an honor and a privilege to serve the almighty God of the universe. Thank you, Lord, for the honor Thank you for making yourself known to us, for calling us to walk with you and to live before you.